This episode of the Party Loaded Podcast is proudly sponsored by Audible.com. Check out their awesome catalogue of audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from. And be sure to grab a free audiobook on us and support the show by visiting audibletrial.com slash endgame. Let's party. Hey everyone, it is Wednesday the 19th of April and this is episode 73 of Party Loaded. Uh, my name is Luke Ritalik and basically we're here to chat to you about video games and we have a group of people to help do that as we do every week. First up on the list tonight we'll have Ollie. Hello Ollie. Hello, I play video games. We, yeah, hell yeah. Let's let's do some games. we got Jam. Yo. Ready to have a game Jam? Jam Jam. Yep, let's do that. <laughs> we also have Mimo. Hello. Hi friends. <laughs> Uh, Deary me. Yep. Well, let, <laughs> let, let's just kick in. There's lots of stuff to talk about. We're all kind of on holidays at the moment. I've kind of just come back from a holiday. Ollie's taken a holiday. Jam, you just have somehow wrangled some time to play games, I'm sure. And Imogen, your yes. your status is kind of holidaying when you shouldn't be in not doing all the stuff that you were going to be doing. When you were <laughs> Working when I'm on holiday and also studying and somehow finding time for games. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's kind of worked out funny Ooh. for all of us. So, no, but it's been a good yeah. time. I, I um, super enjoyed uh, listening to the uh, the Persona chat last week. So, well done, team. And uh, well done, ladies, especially, for uh, recounting your exploits in the game. I'm keen to hear about some more tonight. So, how's that all going? And Christian. Yeah. Shadow Mimo himself. Absolutely. Mm. We've been lost without him. Mm. We would have been yelled at by the internet for all of our <laughs> lack of knowledge about Persona. <laughs> uh, you sunk a whole bunch more time in this week. Where, where's that sort of at at the moment? Oh, Jam's Jam overtook me. That's where we're at. A little. little bit. Ooh. Yeah, a I'm little still bit. stuck in the third. <laughs> still stuck in the third palace. Um, was severely under level compared. To, you can compare your stats to everybody else at the same time on the same date, oh, and sweet. they were all sort of yeah. If you log on to the sort of network. So I was about five levels behind. So I spent some time leveling myself up and giving it a go. Mm -hmm. So, and then Jam will uh, be zooming ahead. (laughs) You're on the next palace. Yeah. I'm still, I'm, I'm in early August and I've infiltrated the fourth palace and I've well ahead of time. Mm. So I was like, I'll make the final run at the treasure, you know, get that out of the way. And then I can just poodle around for the rest of the, till the deadline. And mm. jump back in and just keep getting slaughtered. So I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I definitely shouldn't be doing this more than two weeks ahead of schedule. <laughs> so I, I was a the, question um, off the back of that, actually, just related to some of the stuff that you, you both mentioned last week. Now, you, you, you sort of talk about deadlines, and I, I understand how the calendar works, that you've got a finite amount of time to sort of do things every day and you have to go to sleep and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, but what so happens when you run out of time? Like, is there a, a deadline for the game in, in its entirety? or There's a each... Uh, without saying too much, because it's it's heavily story driven, mm. each palace uh, and your infiltration of it to steal someone's distorted desires mm. is linked to real world events, and it's a real world deadline and uh. circumstance or consequence that you're trying to preemptively, you know, get ahead of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I believe it's game over. I think so too, but yeah, we haven't failed, <laughs> so we don't know. So a hypothetical example, which probably is completely unrelated to anything that happens in game, just, just so I get my head around this. So there was a character who was going to give a very influential press conference at some point and you needed to like change his personality, like his persona, because he was going to do something that was like of evil sort of design at that event. You kind of want yeah. to do that before he does that thing in the real world. Yeah. Is that kind of what it's, you're getting at? That's, that's the sort of thing yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you're, mm. that you're trying to, um, to beat. And, and the thing is you've got... You've got to tweak it because what you have to do is you have to identify the route to the treasure mm. a couple of days beforehand because then you have to hop out of the palace and send a calling card. And what that does is materialize the distorted desire within the palace so that you can steal it. Uh-huh. Um, for that to happen, the person in question needs to feel There's under a lot threat. Of planning. Yeah, so, a lot of planning. Yeah. <laughs> and you've got, to, you've got to work up to that point in stages too quite often because of – your limited resources or whatever. Mm. So it's involved. I had a question. Yeah, I had a question though. 
Is the 7th of July, does it make sense why it's a no streaming? Nope. Mm. Interesting. I think it's just it's just a point where they're like, you know what, from this point on, we don't want any spoilers. Any. Huh, interesting. Hmm. At least in my game, that's yep. that was the case. I have listened I to let a you know bunch how I of other people talk about that particular point as well, and the impression I got from them was that there apparently was an event around that time that might actually um, be a bit, a bit spoilery. But having not played the game myself, I've oh, got really? no way of confirming that. Yeah, yeah. I don't recall that. I'm so that. glad. Hmm. Yeah. I'm so, I, I saw a lot of other sort of podcasts and stuff that I listened to did like the Persona chat and they all talked about that point. I was like, oh, I just I just don't know if I'm going to listen to it and they're going to just say something that's going to spoil it for me. So I want to get further into just the game Just remember they're I not Luke. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I don't know as well if people haven't played the game and they'll say something and then I'll put two and two together kind of thing. Yeah. Anyway. It's just one of those things. I'm just super Ollie's because right, I though, want for, for your sakes, it's probably just as well that I'm not playing this at the moment because I, I reckon I would struggle yeah. to not talk about it. It sounds yeah. like it's so <laughs> yeah. just blurst, just the blurst. Uh, it's tough. <laughs> if you get excited, it's really, really hard. It's you know, literally. I know. Oh. Jam, finish Horizon Zero Dawn already. For <laughs> I'm working sake. on it. I'm working yeah. on it. I was working on it today. Then finish Mass Effect. I know. Okay. <laughs> just, I don't care about Mass I'm Effect. I'm only human. <laughs> <laughs> Despite, you know, popular belief <laughs> that maybe robot. Um, I'm working on it. <laughs> working on it. You've been working on something else in the meantime, though. Uh, and I, I hear that you had a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a run in with Ollie during the week oh, playing God. something else. <laughs> Don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, so uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, uh, loading as pairs with Ollie is hit and miss. <laughs> 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 I agree. Jamie is a very inconsistent partner. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, 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 okay. She so ran me over. I did not run you over. I did not run you over. <laughs> I was driving, you got shot, and you fell in front of the car. It's not my fault. <laughs> That's a defense that'll hold up in fault. court for sure. <laughs> yeah. This is not my fault. I By swear, the time he I fell knew out I ran him over, it's That's, too that's late. right it's up there late. with the, he, he uh, fell over on the dagger 23 times. It's all good. Couldn't swerve. <laughs> couldn't swerve. Would have rolled the car, risk my own life. Didn't realize he'd fallen out. I just went, what? You're dead? He even what came happened? up in the kill feed. Jams 44 had his run over. I was a little focused <laughs> on avoiding bullets. I was driving serpentine without rolling my little, uh, was it a buggy? Were UAZ. We, a buggy? we had a UAZ. Oh. Okay, but, but, better story, funnier story. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we were looting You didn't these... die from this one at least. Yeah, by some freaking miracle. We were looting some houses and we were both on the um, second floor and we heard footsteps and we realised neither of us were moving. <laughs> so we both dropped prone in different points of the room to cover the stairway and um, <laughs> Ollie's like, now don't freak out. I'm just going to throw a grenade down there. And I was like, uh, okay. This and started totally trying to sounds like something backwards. I would do. <laughs> and started trying to crawl backwards. And sure enough, he throws it at the wall and it bounces over the balustrade straight at me. And it was like, bang. <laughs> I don't know how I didn't die. I was on like a fingernail of health. But we, yeah, we it turns mowed out grenades down. are really bouncy. Yes. We mowed down the first guy that came up. And I like oh, he panicked, got effed. panicked, healed myself. And then we were lying there for so long trying to figure out if he had a buddy around because it was pairs. And the zone started shrinking, so we had to make a run for it. So I run down the stairs with my AK, and there's this guy standing under the stairs. And somehow, he must have been in a menu or something. I managed to unload into him before he could shoot me. But, oh, my God, stress. And then was that the one we had to fang it and we, like, just made it into the circle without dying? That's most games, to be fair. That's oh, an Australianism chaos. for you. Ooh. Fang it. Define <laughs> yeah, mm. fang it. <laughs> Just go really, to run really fast. Really fast. <laughs> fang it, mate. Leg so, it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was funny. And we played some with my brother and my cousin. That was hilarious. So, what, what's the highest Just, finishing position that you've uh, all managed so far? Oh, so uh, it wasn't that game, but on one of them, it was the one where Ollie died, where he got shot out of the, the yeah. car. I managed to get to fourth. Oh, that's pretty good. Um, out of a hundred, hmm. I was. <laughs> so we well, were driving. Duo, so would have been four out of fifty. Okay. Yeah, no, but there were only four players left. Ah, yes, that's true. The <laughs> math. The zone by that point was really tiny, and I'd managed to get to this little town. It was next to first, and I was just hiding in a sea container. And I could hear people approaching because it was shrinking and shrinking, and I was oh, panic God. shooting outside the door because I was like, "Oh God, I don't want to die." 
And then I had to just run out at some point because the zone shifted off into the middle of this field and sure enough, I got shot. Yeah. Yep. It but certainly it's seems very like... entertaining. It seems to me like when the map is that small, being the aggressor might be the better position to be in. So you've got the momentum to kind yeah. of... Yes and no. I mean, you want to let them kill each other as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's incredibly yeah. situational dependent, that game. Yeah. There's no, like, yeah. set you do this. It is... So different mm. each time. I lost, I lost my brother though. He's like very near top ten in singles, Ooh. like globally. He's very good, mm. and when he groups up with people, he's playing with some like Rocket League pros right now. I think they just they all they just have such a knack for this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so I've got to gonna start watching him play, <laughs> learn some strategy. Although I don't think I'll ever quite have his skill, but mm. it's just so funny to watch. Mm. Well, given how stupidly um, popular this game has been and how successful it has uh, sort of been in the last few weeks, just topping just about every country's chart on uh, Steam that I've seen, I, I mean, the, the money must be flowing in thick and fast. Have they actually kept up with their end of the bargain as far as ongoing updates and improvements to the, the game goes? Uh, yeah. I think I saw a link today about the monthly update, but I didn't have time to read it. So, yeah, they're responding to feedback and yeah. um, very engaged hmm. and everyone's still absolutely loving it. I think from memory, the next one that's being done is purely on optimization and getting it more optimized, reducing server lag, all that sort of stuff. And then their next other big update that I think is at least two weeks away um, is they're introducing an actual vaulting mechanic so you can actually vault over things now as well. Oh, that will be good. Sounds cool. Yeah, that'll that'll make a big difference. I'm just looking forward to private servers so we can just have the four of us like dropping Mm. at different points of the map. Yeah, and, nah. The chaos <laughs> that ensues. No, I reckon <laughs> hard pass. Uh, I actually don't think I'd enjoy that as much. Yeah. Uh, probably not, but... yeah. But I would fine. rather have it as a co-op with us. Allying together with your buddies who you can talk to on team chat does sound like the funner option. Yeah, yeah rather than just shit talking Yeah, the whole getting time. grenaded by your buddies is great. Yeah. It's almost as good as being run over. Yeah, I remember when we used to play Overwatch against each other, and that was no fun. I didn't enjoy that. So mm. <laughs> I like being on the same team with people who can play games. Same team, man, same team. Uh, well, I've been uh, listening to all of this sort of chat during the um, the last week or so while I've been away and getting super jealous about all the, the fun stuff that's going on. I'm going to have to pick that game out real soon, I think. But um, mm. I, I've gotten a little bit of gaming in the last sort of 10 days or so since I've um, been overseas. Uh I, I had these intentions of um, sort of catching up on a bunch of uh, 3DS games, actually. Like, I, I still had to finish off um, uh, the latest uh, Zelda um, Link Between Worlds uh, sort of uh, title, which I haven't quite finished yet. I've been chipping away at that for a while, actually. Um, and I actually haven't finished the um, the single-player campaign for Pokemon Sun and Moon yet either. And uh, I sort of cracked that open one day and then immediately thought better of it because the problem is that I have a son who's obsessed with Pokemon and any time you give him an inch, he will not shut up about it for days. Mm -hmm. So he kind of kills my joy for that game because I just have to put up with it incessantly afterwards and I I know how I must sound to certain other people in my adult life when I start talking about games. (laughs) So... uh, About, you know, no games in particular. So I played a lot of Hearthstone while I was away. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, oh dear yeah no I, like, honestly that's probably the thing i played the most while i've been away and um b- before i forget big shout out to christian uh over the last week because he has managed to achieve a goal that i've not managed to hit myself yet and he hit legend status in hearthstone last week Ooh, so well, well done. done christian great effort mm, so cool good work shadow Mimo. yeah he, he's <laughs> been plugging along um sort of in legend uh sort of mode since then as well and i saw tonight he was up around the rank 600 mark or something in the american America um, sort of region. So that's pretty good, actually. He's he's very, very high there. I think that puts him at probably top 1% or 2%, um, if, you know, probably even less than that, actually, if I do my maths correctly. But, uh, yeah, I, I've been having a great time. Like all of the um, the new Legend of... On, uh, Legend. Journey to Angoro cards have been super sweet. I, I think that if... Um, I look at all of the expansions for this game. The last one, the um, Mean Streets of Gadgets Am, was probably my least favourite. And this one is probably my favourite out of all of them. I think they've done a really, really good job on this one. And for no 
other reason that they haven't kind of forced a few obvious deck archetypes with all the different um, sort of builds that are going around. There is just literally so many different ways you can build good decks at the moment that there's just a huge variety and it makes games really interesting because you're not facing the same thing every single time. There's been a few that have been common, but heaps and heaps of variety, which is a bit different to, to what tends to happen when the meta sort of uh, levels itself out after an expansion launch, but it's been good fun. So yeah, I, I may try and push for Legend this month. I'm doing all right at the moment. I'm sitting up around rank eight or nine currently, so I, I can do it if I really push myself. It's going to require some time, though. So, mm. yeah. But um, I was playing the other day and uh, and saw a friend in the friends list actually on plan as well. And uh, <laughs> I was surprised. So, Imogen, how are you finding the game at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> I have succumbed. God damn you, Blizzard, and all of your great games <laughs> sucking me in all the time. Oh, uh, uh, yes. I picked up Hearthstone again. Sorry. And I love it. Oh, and I'm the worst. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did open some space stuff. You did open some sweet <laughs> yes. stuff. Oh, yeah. I got... Uh, help me out here, Luke. Is it an epic? No. no legendary. Legendary. It's... um Legendary. I, I forget what his full title is, but it's uh, Oathkeeper Tarim or something. Um, epic yep. Paladin uh, card. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, which is great since I don't play Paladin. Sun, so Sunkeeper Tarim. That's the one. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. I, and I, I hate playing Paladin. But I jumped back in and I was saying to Jam before, I was trying to figure out... Because I always think about jumping back in and just for whatever reason thought I'll give it a go and I'll open some packs and everything else. And then, uh, yeah, I've been hooked. And I think it's because it's easy because it's on my iPad. Mm. Um, that's what I've decided because I can sort of, I can even lie in bed, which is great for my sleeping patterns while studying. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I can get a couple of games in in like a study break. Um, or get a couple of quests done or things like that. But it's been good. Um, a little bit of a ramp up to learning what to do. My favorite sort of constructed hunter deck got decimated in the standard mode with all of the cards that got retired. So I put a couple of new ones in there and kept the same sort of strategy. And I'm doing okay. I got up to rank 20, which is all I want. Mm -hmm. I just want that box yeah. at the end of the season. And I did the tavern brawl. And I'll just keep playing in general mode quite like playing in casual. I've found a lot of people who I don't think have played the game before and I win against those people. But if they have a more recent card back, then I'm 90% chance of losing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, playing, playing casual at the, at the lower ranks, um, or actually even playing ranked mode at the lower ranks is usually a, a better bet, I think, because you'll, you'll tend to find people similar to yourself who are sort of jumping into the ranked mode for the first time. Whereas casual... Uh -huh. I mean, there is an algorithm within the game that tends to match you against people who have um, a similar amount of experience in game as you, but I don't know how accurate it is. But um, a lot of people who play hardcore ranked decks tend to test them out in casual before they jump back in and uh, have the results affect their ranking as well. So you can come up against some pretty nasty uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah, I got absolutely destroyed by someone just before when Jam jumped off online. Hmm. Just absolutely destroyed, and that was a bit soul destroying. I do have to say that I'm going to have to play quite a lot to be able to build up my roster to the point. I'm seeing some other people play cards, and I'm like, oh, that would be sweet to have. Mm. Where the hell is that card from? And I don't have anywhere near enough dust to make stuff, so I either invest actual money and buy packs, or I just keep playing arena and play get gold, do arena. Sort of. I don't really mind slogging away at that. That's not. A big deal well, um, picking a small number of classes like is another good way to do it because you can dust your cards from the other classes and sort of fill in the stuff that you need um and just focus on those but ones. what if i need them in the future luke yeah, what if well, i decide that, that's kind that of paladin's not a yeah. terrible terrible like person to play yeah and i need them in the future <laughs> oh, i agree it's a tough yeah, I'll, trade -off. I'll dust my epic should i just dust my epic luke would you like that <laughs> i'll video it and i'll send it to you <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, look, I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend it because if you do ever want that card again, it costs a hell lot more to, to craft it. But uh, I don't know, sticking with Hunters is a good safe pick because the, the good Hunter decks are usually reasonably cheap to craft and um, Hunter's very good at the moment. So uh, Hunter's actually what Christian yeah. made Legend with um, and I've been playing quite a bit of Hunter at the moment too. So I am loving all of the super adorable little like hatchlings and dinosaurs and things. Yeah. So I've been contemplating just building a deck for fun that's just all like lizard based stuff mm -hmm. or like... Um, Lizards and Panthers and Bears, oh my, is a one that I've started to build. <laughs> nice. There's actually a really good um, Druid deck doing the rounds at the moment called Egg Druid, and it's basically based around a lot of the egg cards that sort of start off and have no attack power, but they hatch into something bigger. Um, so the, yeah. the deck kind of manipulates those creatures and, and uh, you know, buffs them up so they can actually attack and crack open and give you the big stuff. So, yeah, it's good It's good fun. There's a lot of fun stuff that you can do at the moment. I mean, I, I'll stop myself now because I literally could talk about it for hours because it's just the funnest it's ever yeah, been. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right, Mr. Player Unknown Battleground for 
15 minutes. Well, let's, well, let's talk for at least <laughs> a couple jam, of minutes about another game that gets a fair bit of airtime on uh, this here show. And uh, I, I think it's worth mentioning our recent efforts in the Overwatch Uprising uh, Is <laughs> event. It? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I jumped in and had my first game of it yesterday when I returned. And um, God damn, that new um, PvE mode is super fun. Ollie, you've had a, probably a bit more of a chance during the week to try and crack into the legendary mode attempts. How far mm. have you actually got into that? Have you actually come close at all? Or uh, Yeah, we made it um, to the OR 14 units mm-hmm. doing legendary. Right that was yeah. pre-door glitch patch. So we haven't tried it post-patch yet. <laughs> What's the glitch? Yeah. I haven't read this. So the glitch for this map was there's a point where you have to hold the payload for it to start up. And yep. then once after that point, you have to escort the payload to the door. Yep. The glitch is as soon as the payload is basically unlocked to move, if you have someone standing at the door, it stops all the Omnic spawning for that section. Oh. oh that's and awesome. so you just have a payload just doop 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 Just rolling doop, down the doop, road. Rolling down yep. the road. So, yeah, yeah it's going to be trickier now. It's going to be trickier. The escort part is pretty difficult. Yeah, I have, I have a feeling we will be able to do it just fine like with how we went today and how jam and i and Chris, i think adrian and whatnot the other day went on did we, expert did we try yeah. was that expert oh okay yeah we did on expert and that was okay that was a <laughs> big deal i was um, mercy for the first time good yeah, no, job you well. how'd you go Whee! all right she until could. everyone died <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then she didn't have a res so you know yeah just things happen luke kept poodling around off where i couldn't reach him i blame luke I, I, oh, I, I sort yeah. of came in at the end. Luke though. is not. <laughs> yeah. Towards the end, you're like, I keep dying. Can you help me with this? <laughs> <laughs> Solve my uh, life issues. Yeah. 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 Luke is definitely. I played this afternoon with, as Mercy healing Luke, and then uh, we played that one game. And I was like, mm, maybe I'll send to Lucio. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was good fun. And we did all right. We did. It's we did a good one yeah. attempt at expert and. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was sort of scraping a bit of rust off for the last few weeks of not playing as well. So, you know, that, that's a thing. Too. I, I haven't played for a few weeks, too. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just yelling at Luke was playing Soldier Jam and I was just like, spam the E button. Every time you've got a heal, just yes. spam it. Just put it drop on the it, ground. Drop it, drop it again. Yeah. <laughs> drop it like it's goddamn hot. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. I hope you guys, I'm not going to be part of the crew that break Legendary, but I look forward to seeing the photo when you do it. Mm-hmm. Um. We'll see. I'll have you guys a super cool spray. Yeah, strike strike team tactical squad. Is that all you get from it? Is a spray? I think it's a pretty, think so. pretty fair chance I'll crack legendary in Hearthstone before I do an Overwatch. That's for sure. <laughs> 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 mm. Oh dear. All right. Well, uh, we've got to move on to the news of the week because we talked a lot about the games that we played, and there's a fair bit of news to get through. First of all, very sadly, um, final nail in the coffin for the Nintendo Mini NES. They have announced that it will be discontinued now in Japan as well as North America, which means that it is off the market, and eBay sales of the device have already tripled. <laughs> what the fuck, Nintendo? You will now- Seriously. <laughs> Strange also decision. Been- Discontinued in Europe now, apparently, as well. Oh, man. Oh, in there, Europe there as well. There is someone Sorry, in yeah. Nintendo head office that has a massive boner for artificial scarcity. i got to say. It is ridiculous. <laughs> it's, just... it's not artificial, dude. They're selling for $300 on eBay. No drama. I know, but they um, could manufacture more. It's like they've got this product that's selling heaps and heaps, and they've just said, oh, no, I think we're, we're good. I think we've got enough money. <laughs> what? Maybe it's because they're going to bring out the mini Super NES. Well, uh, there was a theory uh, going around that they uh, could bring uh, out a second version of the Mini NES with a different lineup of games, but I don't think that yeah. that would happen. A longer because... cable for the re- controller. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> no, but when you look at the um, NES, they've got all the best titles on the, the one that's come out already. So if they were going to have another crack at it, um, look, I reckon there's two reasons why they could be doing this. Number one, well, three reasons. All right, number one is they actually are trying <laughs> to create like a collector's item with artificial scarcity, which for commercial reasons doesn't make a lot of sense because they could like make a lot more money out of it if they didn't do that because really the the resellers on eBay are the ones that are making the margins this way, which seems odd. Um, the second reason could be that they're looking at moving a bunch of these titles over to the virtual console shop on the Switch, which that makes a bit of sense. Like if they don't want people buying yep. it on the mini NES, then that kind of does sort of uh, make a bit of sense with that. But the, the other reason you've just mentioned it, it could be they're planning on uh, having like a mini SNES. And I hope that that's the case because holy crap, there's some SNES games that I'd love to play again on a remade console. Um, but if they are going to launch something like that, I, I think it's probably a, a year or so away. We'll have to see. I think it's a little bit of, of all of those things. Mm. Nintendo 
will not and hate cannibalizing any of their own profits. Mm. So with the release of the Switch, they might see that, you know, if they create a scarcity as in the brand, so lots of like Nintendo is a brand, so it has a knock-on effect um, of the scarcity. But also I really hope that the issues with the mini NES, which is why I didn't pick it up around the controllers and the reboot Switch and saving and all of that stuff, that the Super Nintendo reversion of it, if that is a thing, would physically be able to fix all those problems because it has its own reset and yeah. memory and all of that stuff. I mean, re- really um, the reason <clears throat> to get these things is for collector's value. If you want to play NES games, there are easier Raspberry Pi-fueled solutions to play those sorts of games. You know, there's ROMs around yeah. the place. But yeah, yeah, I mean... Also, it's incredibly easy to get an original NES or Super NES refurbished. True. In Australia, it was cheaper than the mini NES to pick one of those up. Mm. So... I mean, a lot of people probably just went, oh, you know what, I'll just get that and then I can have the four games that I want rather than 50 games and only three that I play yeah. for more money. So I don't know. Maybe it was a, a toe in the water and they'll see something else. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, sad times for Nintendo, but hopefully it'll that we'll see something else from them. And maybe I'll pick up a mini NES. They'll, they'll do fine. Next they've, got, up- they've got Banana Yellow Switch controllers coming out. They'll do fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Honestly, the stuff for this Switch. I've s- started seeing all these posts now of like actually having the millennial rooftop party with the Switch now, <laughs> which is God. just brilliant. I'm loving it. <laughs> Speaking of millennials, not really. I have no idea <laughs> why like, that's so great. Game in. <laughs> um, the next item on the list is something I don't know a lot about, and that's um, the release of Yakuza Kiwami coming to PS4 now in August, Luke. Yeah, I'm super excited about this. So, um, you know, Yakuza Zero, uh, which came out a few months back, we reviewed on now um, on the YouTube and uh, talked a fair bit about it on the show. Uh, was the prequel to, of course, the original Yakuza, um, and that is what this is. So, Yakuza Kiwami is basically a HD remake of the original uh, 2005 Yakuza, um, which I don't actually believe ever came to the Western market. It was a Japanese release um, and it was a PlayStation 2 game. So this has gone back away now, but um, it's going to have completely recreated graphics. Uh, They've got um, re-recorded audio from the game's original Japanese voice actors. um, And they've added a bunch of extra stuff in there as well. Like um, they've got a a new system using the um, the second protagonist from uh, Yakuza 0, uh, Majima Goro. He's the the, um, guy who does the the dance fighting and the has the baseball bat um, sort of stuff, um, the one that's a bit crazy. Um, he's basically going to have a mechanic where he shows up just about everywhere in this game and is kind of like a, an ongoing um, fight that you have with a, a random appearance sort of character in game. Um, but yeah, they're redoing a whole bunch of new cutscenes. There's about 30 minutes of new stuff um, cutscene wise in there. I'm really excited. Like if they're redoing this game to capture the um, the quality of Yakuza Zero, but with the original sort of story, which I, I'd love to sort of go through that tale because it's supposedly really really good. It's it would just be the the dated nature of the game that would let it down and if anything um, and if that's no longer a factor then holy crap sign me up yeah i'm gonna get this <laughs> like day one it's it's uh exciting so yes and uh yakuza You're 6 obviously is coming very out excited. next year too so hmm, yeah yeah it's gonna be busy good. busy good thing you have a ps4 huh <laughs> mm-hmm. yep <laughs> solid so following up we haven't spoken about it an awful lot but we've got more details uh this week on the star wars battlefront 2 ollie Yes, so Star Wars Battlefront 2 launched its trailer, looks super cool, has all the fights from actually across the Star Wars era as well. They didn't show any Clone Wars or anything like that, but they did show like original trilogy fights and they did show some Force Awakens related fights. And the main thing that everyone's sort of, you know, taking interest in is for the single player campaign is that you'll actually be playing a uh, Empire, well, what's left over of it. Empire um, Special Ops Trooper, who the whole campaign basically is going to be revolving around them getting revenge for the Emperor being blown up on the Death Star because they're on Endor. So you will play as a Inferno squad member Iden Versio, mm-hmm. who's like a TIE fighter spec ops soldier. And yeah, they're on Endor at the final fight, see the Death Star blown up and like, well, let's get some revenge. And so it's all about going to be from the Imperials perspective which would be interesting Mm. and Mm. a couple of the sort of uh, extended universe books and stuff have touched on like the um post death star blow up and how the empire tries to recover and you know keep its shit together with no emperor at the helm sort of deal and seeing the like aftershocks of 
removing the Empire's influence and protection from a lot of planets, how it's actually not necessarily a good thing. I hope they touch on that, like planets that are now like, no, the Empire was actually great. It kept us protected from all these like terrible people over here. They're now murdering and pillaging everything. Mm. Thanks, Rebels. Where the Rebels are seen as bad guys, I would actually quite like that. Mm. Then it, mm. Moral ambigu- ambiguity would be nice in these games rather than Empire's bad. Rebels are good. <laughs> yeah. Like, I like my shades of grey. It's very easy just to paint them as space Nazis, but there's a whole lot more going on than just that. So, yeah. It is. It is entirely that. Mm. So, yeah, it looks cool. Oh, well, we'll see. You'll definitely be picking it up, though, right, Ollie? I am going to wait because Ooh. I got a little bit bitten, as you may remember, with the original Battlefront. I was like, yep. this game is great. Yep, going well. Oh, all the pre order people are absolutely obliterating. Yeah. Other people, it's pay to win. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and I went a little bit downhill. So I'm going to wait and see. If they do the same model, I won't. If they do a different model where it's not so much pay to win, then I'm on board. Or maybe a larger single player focus, perhaps. Oh, yeah. Even, yeah. If the single player focus is good, everyone's like, man, single player game, like um, COD 4. Hmm. Yeah. If they do, like, single player is awesome, I'd be like, cool. I won't even worry about the multiplayer at that point if the single player is great. Yeah. So yeah. I'll I wait think a see. lot of people are hoping for that. They're hoping for that more in-depth single-player story-based mm. stuff. Mm. Make it a much more interesting game. We shall see. Uh, speaking of very interesting games, this is something that came across um, my sphere, thanks to Shadow Mimo, in fact. Um, mm. Christian posted up a link to a trailer that came out around 30 seconds long and uh, of a beautiful, um, from Bandai Namco, sorry, I should mention, beautiful stylized um sort of graphical trailer i guess or teaser and the only other than you know some very beautiful sort of scenes we had the end of the trailer with um prepare to dine and that was all of the information that we all got so the internet was going a little bit abuzz about what this was what it meant was it a new game was it you know what was happening and today we have received confirmation from Bandai Namco that this is going to be their new game known as Code Vein. We don't have any more details past that at this stage, but they have hinted towards um, an April 20 worldwide announcement, which means that by the time you're listening to this, it has already been announced. So I recommend you go and look it up, especially if you're a big fan of unique art styles. It looks pretty cool. The, calm, the prepare to dine is based on the fact that the, the protagonists have a, a vampiric background um, and they defeat and, and absorb power of enemies. So more details will have happened by the time you listen to this. So we will have to catch everybody up. But I recommend that you Google prepare to dine or Bandai Namco trailer and you will find it online and take a look because it is spectacular. <laughs> Very excited. But like as per normal, you know, this is very early date, so this could be a year away, could be something they're releasing three months from now, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Question marks everywhere. Well, Bend on Namco were right behind thing. Souls, so Dark Souls, so mm, yeah. we'll see. We'll see. It's it looks pretty- super cool. The art it style looks- is mint. Yeah, if they can retain that in a flowing sort of narrative driven game, I'm a hundred percent down because it looks beautiful. Mm. Um, and the hints towards it being sort of co-op as well sounds badass. I'm 100% down if it's co-op <laughs> um, for the main storyline would be great, the buddy system. As long as it's more uh, um, Van- Vampire the Masquerade and less Underworld, <laughs> basically, that would be cool. <laughs> and not Twilight. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never forget Twilight. Uh, uh, I'd rather I could. Yeah, nice. most people would. Uh, more Blizzard news uh, in a way is that uh, Heroes of the Storm are going to have a new hero and it has been announced to be Genji this is coming out in the 2.0 version of Heroes of the Storm you will also be able to play on a map that is styled on Hanamura which is an Overwatch map Mm -hmm. so that's interesting little crossover it's got a payload Um, as well Overwatch Mm. got a payload I wonder what that payload would be yeah, yeah, you have to actually guide, guide the payload from point A to point B on the map to, to unlock some sort of power, <laughs> which I, I think is a cool idea for a um, uh, Heroes of the Storm map. They haven't done anything like that before, so... Oh, yeah. that might be worth going back in to check out. Hmm. Oh, gosh, then I've been playing all of the Blizzard games again. My goodness, I'm back three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? I've gone What's into the past. New again? Life is a cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Life is a cycle. We will, uh, speaking of cycles, be seeing a new competitor... For Steam, allegedly, I'm skeptical. 
Tencent have announced uh, that they will be releasing globally uh, their Wii game platform. Mm. Uh, Tencent have a gaming platform not dissimilar to Steam, but with a huge user base uh, in China. But they're now saying that they will release sort of globally, um, that it will be a competitor to Steam. And, you know, of course, their numbers are, are you know, huge when you're looking at versus Steam uh, because of their audience. But chatting about it offline, I have some reservations as to the just the information. I mean, volume of numbers doesn't make it a platform that we would necessarily want to play games of. Um, well, but I mean, it does have yeah. a big feather in its cap in that, um, Tencent own Riot Games, which is the purveyor of League of Legends. So if they release a, to a global audience, it might mean that people are now playing through Tencent Wii game to play League of Legends, mm. which would capture them a big global audience. That's, I, don't, I don't see them stomping on Steam or stealing from Steam by any means at this stage. I don't think it's a I case of sort of, you know, writing Steam out of the competition. It's just... I think it's nice to have something that potentially could be a rival to Steam because it's a very yeah. monopolized marketplace at the moment and having s some options that are actually legitimate competitors would be a good thing. It would probably help yeah. to even that playing field a little bit. I mean, a lot of people love that whole sort of um, centralized, uh, you know, game library thing that Steam's got going for it. And, you know, I certainly do too. But at, at the end of the day, the reason why there hasn't been a good Steam competitor up until this point is because a lot of the other games companies that have their own sort of launches that have um, built-in stores, most of them are really crap. <laughs> like, they just haven't invested mm. the, the capital into developing them as, as decent systems. And, I mean, Steam's got a lot of issues as well. But, you know, a, a company the size of Tencent, which is, you know, more and more with each passing year dipping their toes further and further into the Western market. I mean, they, they own part of, uh, you know, Activision Blizzard as well. And they probably own a lot more of it if uh, they had their own small way. Small part. Yeah. Small part. Very, very small part. But, um, I mean, that, they uh, I think we talked about a, a year or so ago, they were looking at launching a um, their own console onto the market as well. Um, so they're making big moves and, uh, you know, balls in their court. If they can come up with something that um, is able to support 200 million um, Chinese users already, it means that they've got the infrastructure to be able to go global. So, I don't know, watch this space, I guess. It's going to be about their library. Mm. It's going to be about what games are available on it. And obviously, if they can move the League of Legends hosting to that, then they'll get an automatic or global audience. But uh, we'll see. Well, we'll there's, see. there's no doubt um, that Steam, owns, uh, Steam owes a portion of its success to the success of Dota as well. So, you know, there is that. Oh, definitely, a hundred percent. And you know, big games like GTA and those types of the big online multiplayers yeah. um, that Steam has you know, on its books are, are sort of big deals. But we shall see. <laughs> I agree with you. Competition's good. If we get more, and it improves both Steam and this new Wii game, then that means we only win, I guess. Yeah. What I would hate to see is, uh, I like I like having everything in the same place, and I know that's it's just you know it's going to be the world we're going to have to get used to. Is everything has its launch, and now we've got Origin, and I've got. Blizzard, and I've got Steam, and I've got umpteen billion other launches for various things. So good for the devs out there too, though. There's more options for them to get their games to the marketplace, which is particularly good for indie devs. True, mm. that's very true. This is scary. Luke, Imogen, and I all agree on something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jamie might agree too. Quick, we have an Jamie. <laughs> Big Jamie, I agree. Oh shit! God oh, damn it! Oh, no. there's, there's no controversy. It's all there's no from here. This. Well, that's it. That's the end of the podcast, guys. <laughs> all right. Good the night, The magic's everybody. in us arguing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Something we can all agree is a good thing for gaming community is an announcement that came out very recently around the Gaming for Life stream that will be happening um, is that Twitch um, have partnered with the Sony Foundation to stream the event. The uh, Gaming for Life stream is a 30-hour charity stream that will is an Australian charity stream, which will provide you with, like I said, over 30 hours of content um, on April 29th. It starts at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, which means very early in the morning, 7 a.m. for West Australian visitors to the to the Switch site. So you can watch it all happen on 6T4 Bytes, and they'll be playing things like Horizon Zero Dawn and For Honor and Prey, and uh, most uh, very heavy PlayStation 4, obviously being um, the Sony Foundation. They're raising money for UCAN, which is a not-for-profit organization that develops uh, youth cancer centers for patients between the ages of 15 and 25. So you can imagine that if you are attending hospital on a regular basis, there's quite a lot for the little kids. 
and obviously there's adult wards as well, but the, the, the youths that are between the age of youths, I said about 502, mm. um, <laughs> the youths aged between 15 and 25, there's not a lot of services for them. Um, and if they go into the, sort of the child area, it seems, feels very babyish. So what you can do is develop these youth centres where there's um, obviously, you know, games and things that they can play and Sony Foundation have been a big supporter of them for some time, um, I believe. Uh, so it's a really worthwhile cause. Um, as per usual, I fully expect this to raise a ridiculous amount of money. Um, Twitch fans tend to have, and the gaming community at large, have a very generous attitude when it comes to these types of things. And the fact that it's um, the an Australian Gaming for Life uh, stream as well is huge. So I'll be checking it out. April 29th. What day of the week is that? Am I going to be at work? Who knows? 29th. It's a Saturday. It's oh, no, it's Saturday. definitely a Saturday because it's also International Tabletop Day. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we can have the stream on in the background while we play tabletop games. That sounds like a cool idea. Oh, no. Now I'm going to have to have two streams of Geek and Sundry and Gaming for Life. <laughs> oh, well. Totally worth well, it. Oh, it's you, right? Different time zones, though, isn't <laughs> some, it? I need some, yeah. Mm. It's different, obviously different time zones. Yeah, the Geek and Sundry one, but um, they're both on Twitch, so I'm going to need somebody else's Twitch login <laughs> to watch both of them at the same time. Well, oh, that'd be cool. We'll, we'll definitely something together. check that that'd out. Be cool. Well, yeah, we'll figure something out. Um, Jamie, you have to finish Horizon Zero Dawn so that we can watch it. I Otherwise, do. I'll spoil stuff for you, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah. We'll wait and see. But yeah, so I highly recommend that when you listen to this, it'll be a, cu- a week away. So it'll be next Saturday if you're listening to that on this Saturday. So, uh, yeah, check it out. Um, you can Google Gaming for Livestream Australia. You can look up 6T4 Bytes um, or look at the Sony Foundation's website and that will direct you in the right place. Sweet. Well, speaking of figuring things out, that's a perfect segue into our topic of the week this week. So we're going to take a, a brief uh, sojourn from all of the, the heavy review topics we've had recently with some of the big game releases um, and dive a little bit more back into one of the, um, I, I guess, sort of game industry uh, topics that um, you know is more to do with how things are made. And tonight we're going to talk about the mechanics in games around game tutorials. So what sort of teaching mechanics games have and uh, how best do they sort of explain the way to play to, to people who are actually picking them up and, and diving in. So um, now I think the reason why this is a really good timely one to talk about at the moment is because this year in particular, we've had some really good recent examples of excellent ways to do this, which we can probably draw on for a bit of inspiration as we, we sort of dig through. But like I, I can't remember which of you it was um, that I had this discussion with a, about a month or so back, but we were kind of reminiscing about the days of yore where, you know, do you remember the times when we used to buy games and they had these massive instruction booklets in them? <laughs> you know? mm, yep. yeah. Games come in a giant box. Yep, yep, exactly. <laughs> and, I mean, some of these instruction booklets were, were no more than an excuse to sort of have the controller scheme sort of laid out and have a whole bunch of note-taking pages for uh, in-game mm. save codes and stuff like that. Not looking at you, Nintendo. Um, but, uh, you know, and sometimes a lot of these books had nice sort of uh, art and illustrations and, uh, you know, bits of story and that kind of stuff in there. But, I mean, the primary I'm looking purpose... at a shelf full of World of Warcraft ones right now. Exactly. And they're all, like, yeah. the size of decent-sized hardbacks. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I do remember the more recent one that I have um, just being, like, a CD rattling around in there. <laughs> so Absolutely. times have definitely changed. Well, I mean, they're kind of a collector's item in the past. And, you know, with everything going digitally now, I mean, you know, people tend to, to buy games digitally a lot more often than buying physical copies. So it makes sense that they have to come up with other ways of, of getting that information across because not everyone's going to have a, an opportunity to get a physical book to explain how to do stuff but thankfully a lot of uh, games have gotten a lot smarter about how they teach people as well so that you you don't actually have to I I mean I don't know about you guys like I I very very rarely even back in those days when I picked up a new game that had an instruction booklet I very rarely pulled out that booklet and read it before I put the game disc in and just started playing and I think that's the (gasps) behavior that a lot of people have sort of gotten (laughs) used to yeah exactly I mean some people did some some people would literally you know open up a game the children who opened up a video game and they went no 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 I'm going to read the instructions first yeah I wonder where those kids are now I'll let- <laughs> If you had to take a train into to the game store and, and uh, you know, you had a, a public transport ride back where you had time to pull it up yeah. and read it, maybe. Oh, that's fair. Yeah. That was that's me. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> But otherwise, not Just many people itching, did. Waiting. I would wager. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so we, we really want to talk about how games teach you how to play and uh, the different ways that the games do that. So um, let, let's kick off and, and sort of go through some of the, the ways. So um, uh, Ollie, do you want to start? What, what's one example of a way that games teach you how to play them? Okay, so a type of tutorial is called tutorial by exposition. So literally, it is 
the game will put an instruction on the screen telling you how to do something. So it'll say, press the W key to go forward. If you want to inter pick that thing up, press the E key. If it's F, you've banned it wrong and you're a terrible person. It should always be E. Um, <laughs> it's always E. E to pick up. If you, yeah. If you want to crawl under there, you know, press shift or jump over this, press space. And it explicitly tells you the game's controls while sort of meandering you through a like small little level almost of the game. Mm. So that's tutorial by exposition. Yeah. And that that's sort of similar but not the same as if you had like a background tutorial so you you have the same sort of information but it's more hidden so it might be that you actually have to go through menus to locate that stuff it could be that it's actually hidden cleverly somewhere in the backdrop of the game and a really good recent example i can actually think of is uh when we played antichamber so the the opening um sort of starting mm -hmm. room of antichamber literally has all of the game controls and instructions set like on a wall in the background so you can look at it or mm. not <laughs> <laughs> you yep. can just wander straight past you. it if you want. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Jam. Assumed player knowledge determined by menu choice at the start of the game. Can you tell that what didn't have the list up? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Jam on the spot. Go for Jam. <laughs> um, so this one is basically uh, letting you use your instinct and saying, okay, have a look at this beautiful painting a la Portal 2. Hmm. And paying attention to the button scheme that you use, um, whether you've inverted Y or not, to set your settings and, and maybe give you a prod if you mess it up. Um, so it's a little more organic. Mm. So Thimbleweed Park that I talked about a couple of weeks ago, um, that actually had this as well because you, you had an option at the very beginning of the game where it sort of said, have you played adventure games before? And it would sort of cater the, the number of instructions that appeared up on screen and the number of tooltips that it had based on which one of those options you choose at the beginning of the game. So oh, there's gosh. another one that I can think of that had that recently too. Did Horizon have that or did um, – I think open world games often have that, that kind of choice. Like have you played – oh, yeah. Usually you will have an option of play through the tutorial or not um, and that's because of replay. True, true. Yeah, interesting. Mm. Um, all right, Imogen, what's up next? Well, that plays nicely into a lot of games have separate tutorial stages or specific missions. So if like five missions at the beginning are just tutorial and usually those are optional or compulsory or a mixture of both. So the first two might be compulsory and the rest aren't. So if you feel like you're sort of getting the idea of things and Farming Simulator is a great example of this, um, hmm. hot tip. If you're going to play Farming Sin Letter, do the damn tutorial. Oh, my God, that game is complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but those are not compulsory. You can go straight into playing the game without any of those, and it gives you the on-screen prompts of how to do things. Um, but honestly, I started playing without knowing that and just people yelling at me and telling me what to do, and then I went back and played the tutorial. You definitely get to a point where you're like, okay, I don't need to have that interest. I'm not interested in that. I did the first two. That's, that's basics. Mm. Um, and everything else was sort of optional. But that's that's fairly common um, in games with have high replayability. Yeah. Replay, uh, or RTSs is fairly common as well. I guess you can also have those tutorial stages that sort of fit chronologically into the game or they're separate entirely. Like Overwatch is a good example because Overwatch has like the, the practice firing range, which is effectively a tutorial um, sort of level. But you can go back and use that if you want to try out different character abilities like after you've been playing for a while and you don't have to sort of do that. that. with Arissa? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's handy to have that available, um, you know, on demand whenever you want it. Then one of the things that uh, I think we're seeing a lot more of these days and it's perhaps a lot more subtle and, um, and well sort of built in is when you have games that slowly sort of introduce um, bits and pieces of information like items or mechanics, um, but they do, they do it in a contextual way. So it actually comes up when it's relevant to learn that information rather than sort of front loading it at the beginning of playing that game. So... A uh, really good example would be uh, Yakuza 0. So there's actually a point in Yakuza where um, you get into your first fist fight and like literally before you sort of go into an alley and break up a mugging, um, it basically gives you a new move that you can try out and it shows you the controls for that. And because you're actually in combat, you might want to use it then and you get to try it out at that time rather than sort of teaching you at a time that it's not relevant. So, um, which I, I think is way, way better because it, it's good for the kinesthetic learners out there. You're going to kind of, you know, you learn by doing as opposed to sort of just trying to store it in your head for when it might come up at a later point. Um, the yeah, it's incredibly common in RPGs because those are about, or narrative-based games, because you're about learning going through the story. Mm. So that makes a lot more sense to learn by doing and whilst you're also doing the story part of it rather than, you know, having a, a character you don't even know, like going through tutorial missions wouldn't really work. Yeah. Fairly common. 
bu building up your skills to a point where Imogen gives up playing the game. Mm. It's too hard. <laughs> 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 uh, well, I mean, Too many new things. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you can have new things that you learn throughout playing a game that aren't actually relevant until much later stages of the game, and they can actually teach you at that later stage. They don't have to put all the learning at the, the beginning parts of, of a game. That could be, you know, really, really complex maneuvers and things that you learn later on. Um, and, I mean, the way they do it too can be really subtle. Like, you, you kind of learn by doing and you don't even realise that you're sort of being taught how to do something. It kind of just happens. Or it can be a lot less subtle. Like the Yakuza example I just gave, um, like you actually get those instructions on screen, so it's kind of, you know, spelled out for you it's that um mm. yeah it's almost that t tutorial by exposition that ollie was mentioning but because it's actually built into the way you're trying to achieve a goal as opposed to learning for the sake of learning you're actually learning on the way to you know playing the game essentially so yeah. you're not going out of your way to, to do a separate activity which is kind of cool so i like that now i guess now that we've sort of gone through a few of the different ways that games do it i want to pose everybody this question do you think that tutorials in the ways that we've just described are always necessary or do you think it's actually okay for some games just to dump you straight in with absolutely nothing and just let you work it out what do you think i think they're not okay why not certainly not always necessary because some games it's fun to be thrown in the deep end with no idea what's going on i mean when i played limbo for the first time mm. it was just this beautiful silhouetted scene and nothing was happening and then i realized oh i can push a button and move him i still didn't know what was going on what i could do in the world like just the mystery was part of the game it was integral mm. to it and and the whole point was you're in this really dangerous you know, tense environment um, and you don't know what's going on and and you don't want to feel like you're in full control because you're supposed to be, you know, on the edge of your seat. So it just, it really fits with the aesthetic of the game. It works really well. And if something had popped up on screen at that moment for, for a game that's um, got such a beautiful, simple design, it would have been rubbish, mm. I think. Mm. Would have broken, broken the immersion of it. Yeah. I really, yeah, I, I agree, actually. I was thinking, oh, no, some form of tutorial is always really necessary. But as you were speaking, I just thought of a game where if they had a tutorial, it would ruin it. And it's her story. Mm. Yeah. Best part about mm -hmm. that game is we went and going, what the crap do we do? All right, I guess we type in some things, like, you know, a word, like random things. And the whole point of that is it, it was part of the game. It's about making you feel like you're a little bit hopeless and where do I even begin and the enormity of it all and everything else. It all becomes clear eventually. You start getting the idea behind it, but it's almost designed for you to not be pro right from the beginning. Mm. Um and, and sort of force you to, to think about what you're doing and how you're doing it. So, but it has, that's, that's a very specific, like, ha, most of the time, then yes, I say tutorials are necessary, but there certainly is cases where it's, you know, I wouldn't say they're always necessary. It, it would depend on mm. the complexity to a degree. Yeah, true. Yeah, Tetris, I'm... does Tetris have a tutorial? <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, I'm sort of like the opposite of Mima. I would say tutorials are mostly not necessary, except in some games where it requires a lot of complexity for the game mm -hmm. so kind of like they're mostly not necessary but then every now and then they're good to have in certain styles of games and i'm very much a fan of either an optional tutorial level or that um storytelling storytelling tutorial yeah. where they actually mix in the learning of the controls in with the actual storytelling and the gameplay rather than just going press w to do this yeah press e to do this I think for yep. me personally, that's the worst type of tutorial where it's just, here's an instruction on the screen, follow it. Mm. It's like, well, yeah. cool, I could have just read my key bindings in the menu. Thanks for wasting my time. Yeah. yeah. Also an option to turn them off. Like, no yes. one needs Clippy popping up <laughs> telling you what to that's, do every five oh, Clippy. seconds. <laughs> that is one thing. I, have I see to you're praise. trying to play Overwatch. Would you like my assistance? <laughs> <laughs> no, fuck off. I have enough Omnics already. Um... That's one thing I have to. I do actually enjoy with Andromeda. It gave you the option to turn tooltips on or off. Yeah. Mm. There wasn't a specific like tutorial. It just went, yeah, you know how to play a game. Cool. Um, it was, do you want tooltips? Yes or no? Like for me, that's almost like the perfect sort of tutorial in that if you do want the tips because you have no idea what you're doing, you want them on. If you don't, you're just like, cool, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. One, so one did a really interesting version of it. One thing I intensely dislike with games that lack tutorials, though, is where you get into this sort of position where the stuff that you want to know and you're forced to seek that information from outside of the game by like googling answers where they could have just as easily provided it within the game itself 
I think that's a, an mm-hmm. example of poor design. Like if it's stuff that people actually want to know without sort of breaking the immersion or breaking the mystery around certain elements, don't force people to look for it outside of what you're trying to entertain them with because that, that's kind of a failing in the game's um, part, I think. Do you mean like seven days to die? Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's an interesting example because you can play I that from both shits. angles. How do I cure that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean... Uh, th- for, on one hand, yes, you're right. We, we kind of <laughs> did get stuck into that position. But on the other hand, a lot of those items, if I had have actually paid attention and read to the fla- read the flavor text that belonged with it, I probably would have worked it out. So it was kind of like a, a case of impatience sort of leading you to seek information elsewhere in a, a more digestible format as opposed to the fact that That's it was That's the lacking. point I was trying to make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that these days I think – I mean, and it's really tempting. It is really tempting to – if you're stuck on something, you go, I'll just, I'll just go to a walkthrough to this part. Like I won't go any further forward, but it will just tell me how to do it. it yeah. It's And it will be there. The internet has it somewhere unless you're a speed runner and you're <laughs> way ahead of everybody else. Well, seven times um, today, I, I did sometimes, have the, um... Sometimes you've got to take the time. Like Persona, they t- it tells you what to do, but if you forget, it's not going to tell you again. You have to sort of open up the options. And it has a very detailed like tutorial, basically manual, yeah. in the background of the game. Yeah. Um, which is sometimes necessary because you're like, okay, I'm missing something entirely, like negotiation skills or yeah. something like that, and and just rehashing and going back over that because when you're playing the game, like because it's teaching you while you're doing the storyline, like we were talking, which is great, but you're like, yep, 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 great, and then you're like, oh crap, I, there's a whole element to this that I didn't realize was a thing. Yeah. Because we're so used to just clicking and being able to get that information. Minecraft recipes. Yeah, well, I think it's brilliant mm. that you have to figure that out. My, Minecraft's a bit di- the weird though because the, the, the mobile version and the PC version are completely different in that respect. Like the PC version doesn't really have the tutorialized recipes. You kind of have to work that stuff out in a lot of cases by Googling it or just experimentation. But when you're playing um, the um, Pocket Edition, it actually does have those um, those recipes in game for you. So you kind of do get that in game tutorial. So Xbox yeah. is the same. Yeah. Yeah. May I propose that's because it's for a different audience? Yeah. yeah. And it's also control scheme specific too yeah i mean keyboards can just do so much more and yeah audience for sure yeah mm. yes it's interesting yeah all right well what is the best way to make tutorials fun then and i think there's probably a lot of good examples of tutorials that are just boring as batshit and you kind of just want to rip through them so you can get into the, the game proper um but there's some really really good examples of tutorials that just rock and you actually enjoy the hell out of them as much as you do the rest of the game so i mean the seven days to die example is probably a, a good example for me of one that a tutorial is not fun because they have those sort of yeah. opening um sort of uh, missions that you do which involves sort of um, you know, crafting various different elements. And there's a few of those that I don't think are necessary at all at that early stage of the game. And you, you kind of, you do it for the sake of doing it, not because you actually need it to survive at that moment. And to me, that's not a fun way to teach people how to play the game. So, but That is early access though. True, true, mm. yeah. So that's not polished. And also you didn't play it multiplayer with randoms. <laughs> I think it would become a lot more rand- <laughs> uh, a lot more important if you had random people killing you every five seconds. Yeah, <laughs> possibly. But you only need to do it once. Like if you come into the game with a different character, it forces you to – well, it doesn't force you. It gives you that stuff again and it's completely superfluous at that mm. point. So, yeah. Yeah. So how do you make it fun? You um, make it I, part of the storyline. <laughs> yeah. If it's if it's a narrative-driven one, you, you work it in so that it, it feels organic. Yeah. World of Warcraft, I, I hesitated putting it into my great examples, but the best tutorial for that game is that it starts you right back at scratch and it doesn't give you like – Pick these seven spells. It literally only gives you one spell at the beginning. You learn how to do that, and then you learn this, and then you learn that. And, and each time you do it, hunter, warrior, whatever, you have to go through that progression and that build, where World of Warcraft makes it very difficult now and maybe not as much fun, um, is when you boost characters. Mm. Um, that was really confusing because I was used to them building me up from nothing rather than giving me a suite of things and saying, okay, now you can mix things around if you want. That was very confusing. But, yeah, if they make it fun and not just, like, now you're going to go shoot these once. You shoot this thing once. Okay, now go over here and shoot this thing twice. Now you can jump and shoot. You know, that's very formulaic. But if it's fun and part of the story, then that's really cool. Well, WoW probably does have a really good example in the form of the starter zones for each of the main races because that's kind of like your tutorial area that um, does factor heavily into the story that your character ends up playing through. So Yeah, that's what I didn't – did I not just say that? 
Well, I mean, but it's, it's based on race, so it's not based on... Maybe. It, it's based on a different thing to what you might expect. So it's not you know, it's not necessarily class-based, it's race-based. So that, that means it's a lot more tied into the narrative than the way okay. you're playing. Uh, okay, yes. That, uh, that's what I meant. But yes, obviously, I've assumed a lot of knowledge on behalf of the audience. My apologies. <laughs> Yeah. Doesn't everybody play World of Warcraft? What the hell? No. We need a tutorial for tutorials. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, How to tutorial. Um, as a good example, that would be like, a great game. I actually went in. Oh, into I'm going to make um, the tutorial game. I, I went in and started Copyright. a goblin character in that game because I, I heard all about the, the cool goblin starting zone and I wanted to play through Just that because bingo. it seemed really fun. So, and yeah. that's a tutorial zone. Like I literally went in and deliberately did a tutorial because I thought it would be a really fun thing to do even though I knew how to play the game. So that that's a mark of success, I think, if they do it like that. I think yeah, um, cool story. for non-story driven games uh, that need some form of a tutorial, I think it's really important to build on a, the sense of wonder and anticipation mm. for the rest of the game. Have Have many of you played Little Big Planet? No. Yes. yes. Yay. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> having Stephen Fry talk to you about what you can do in the game while you're this adorable little sack boy with all of these beautiful things popping up around you is just it's so it's delightful it's so soothing and it wonderful is. and great it is and it just makes you so excited to get playing and and you're paying attention even though it's sort of a bit of a a rote series of you can do this you can do that here's where you got to do this it's delightful the way yeah. it's been written now, not the all way it looks on the screen that far yeah. yeah, I remember the voice in my head. <laughs> it's so lovely, and and it just it just uh, makes you look forward to the rest of the game more and more. It's such a good way to do it. Cool. Um, well, I mean, we could probably talk about what makes some tutorials really really fun by going through some examples of ones that were really enjoyed with specific games. So, I I mean, one of the ones that I think of from recent times that just wowed me with how effective it was and how awesome it was was the uh, the intro to Horizon Horizon Zero Dawn, which sort of formed the tutorial. So when you're playing through as young Aloy. So good. Oh, it was just perfect. Just yeah. amazing. So, I mean, that was quite fun. starting off young means that you obviously don't have all the abilities of adult Aloy yet. And you kind of, you know, coming of age and going through, you know, your first hunting tr- um, sort of uh, sort of adventure, I guess, basically going out to the wilderness, um, you know, under the guidance of uh, Rost, your sort of guard- guardian. And, um, you know, he basically teaches you the basics of hunting like he would a young child, and it's fully integrated with the story, so it doesn't feel like a tutorial really at all. It's awesome. It's a tutorial montage. Yeah, exactly. Everybody <laughs> needs a montage. Yeah. <laughs> of course you do. Yeah, no, so that was a really, really cool example, and um, I think, you know, it introduces the concept of the, the game worlds while sort of filling you that, with that sense of wonder, which is almost amplified because you are looking at it through a child's eyes as opposed to an adult character, which you know, it was almost mm. the perfect tutorial for me. I thought it was a really, really great example. And the, yeah. the other one I wanted to mention too, because this has been a, a big discussion in recent times, um, was uh, the Legend of Zelda Breath, Breath of the Wild. So, I mean, one thing that's been said a lot about this game is that it's a game that really sort of removes the rails and just lets you run at it at a pace that you want. Um, and it, it's true to a certain extent because you can literally run at the final boss in Hyrule Castle in the middle of the map like immediately when you get into that game but there is actually a tutorial area for that game that you have to complete before you go further and that's where you start There's, you're basically on like a great plateau and you can't get down into the rest of the world because it's a lethal drop until you get a, um, a hang glider um, sort of uh, piece of equipment and you get that by completing four shrines at the beginning of the game that basically give you the different runic abilities and teach you how to use them so so the, the nature of the puzzles themselves actually teach you how to use each of those items at each of those shrines to overcome the challenges within before you sort of get released out into the, the main game world. Um, but everything else you learn throughout that game um, after the, the bare basics there are pretty much just exploration and, you know, just a sense of wonder as you discover things for yourself. Um, and there's a lot to learn, but the game does a really good job of giving you some some hints too, because all of the loading screens between areas, like when you're teleporting around and that sort of stuff, actually have like uh, tips. So, um, you know, learning about how the lightning mechanic um, worked in game, for instance, like striking metal objects during stormy weather, um, that was actually a clue on one of the loading screens that, uh, you know, gives you a bit of information about that. doesn't tell you exactly what to do. It just gives you a hint what might happen under certain circumstances. So there's a lot of stuff like that. Um, there's a shield surfing mechanic in the game um, as a great example where you can actually get a shield jump um, while you're running down a slope and actually put it under you and surf down a mountain on that shield 
figuring that out on your own would be really, really tough. But there's a hint in one of those loading screens that actually prompts you to try something like that. You work it out that way. So I think that's a really, really effective way of doing it um, without sort of, you know, putting you too much on, on rails, which is good. Yeah. yeah. Having played the game, I completely agree. We ha- I haven't actually finished the starting plateau area, but yeah, I agree. The shrines are an awesome way of going, here's your runes, figure out what they do. Mm. So I really have been enjoying that as a sort of learning curve. Rather than it goes, here's your abilities. You're like, oh, uh, oh God. Yeah. Because <laughs> that would be slightly overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Um, what other examples have you guys got of ones that you really enjoyed? Well, I, I mean, one that I'm still struggling with at the moment, it's a tutorial that never ends. Uh, insert song here. <laughs> uh, oh, Ori in the Blind Forest. <laughs> your favourite. <laughs> my favourite. And it is my favourite, but it's an example of a tutorial where you, throughout the game, gain new abilities, which gives you access to new areas, which means sometimes backtracking um, over the map. And for me, it has just reached a point where it is very difficult and and the, the difficulty doesn't seem to be getting less, just just more, just exponential, <laughs> mm. just growing. And the puzzle every time I'm like, whoa, that was a really hard puzzle. It's like, here, you think that was hard, here's it times ten. We'll give you a new ability which will make it ten mm, percent easier. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it it's really good um if you are good at playing games, which I am not. Mm. Um, platforming games. So but it's great in that it doesn't give you anything and it's um, everything sort of straight up. It's not linear. So even though you're traversing a map and doing quote unquote levels, you get abilities much later in the game that you can go back to other places. So once you have the ability to swim, you can go back and go and get this puzzle piece or this, that, this, that, the other. So if you want a hundred percent the game, there's a lot of um, finding out secrets and, and noting where you can, <clears throat> sorry, where you can go and where you can't go. I'm losing my voice. Mm. No. It's because, yeah, I'm talking badly about Ori in the Blind Forest earlier. Exactly. Cursed, cursed. by the universe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, with um, that game, yeah. would you say, for this is uh, for more the others because you've stopped at a certain point, um, would you agree that it sort of is constantly introducing new stuff till about three quarters in the game? It's only sort of the last quarter where it's not like, here's a new ability sort of thing or like, here's a new thing you can try. Would you say it's about the three quarter mark or so? Mm. Ish. Ish? I think so. The game reminds me a yeah. lot of um, Super Metroid in that respect as well, like where you sort of get your various you different that. weapons and power-ups, and it teaches you to use them in the exact same way. Um, so, yeah, but you, but you do reach a point where some of the choices that you make from that point onwards um, aren't necessarily crucial to finishing the game, so it probably doesn't need to teach you any further. It sort of just lets you go out and make those decisions for mm-hmm. yourself. Because um, yeah. all of the different upgrade trees for your abilities in Ori in the Blind Forest, you don't have to fill out all your upgrades. You can easily finish the game on a whole lot less than the full sort of uh, tree of those power ups. So, yeah, doesn't it? Agreed. Have to teach you how to use them. Yeah, and I think another sort of example for me is where it's a little bit light on would be GTA Online. Mm. So jumping on to that game, there is <laughs> there is no tutorial on GTA Online, and you will learn very quickly about the internet. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm playing online games. Single and player is essentially the tutorial. Assume, <laughs> I was yeah. going to say, yeah, single player is the tutorial for GTA Online. Yeah. yeah, and you have to play, and that's why it was notable, is you have to play part of the single player campaign before you can even get access to GTA Online, um, which I guess teaches you the sort of basics. But the best thing about GTA Online is when you get into the actual game, it'll give you the prompts on screen mm. to help you out um, most of the time. Uh, I'm very lucky in that I play with a controller on GTA Online on PC. Um, the controls on keyboard sound like a nightmare. And every time we play ah. without fail, we've got like a mix of people on controllers and someone will say, what key is this? And you'll get four different answers because Luke that plays with a mapped fun. PS4 controller. Um, Jam and I play with Xbox and Ollie plays with the keyboard. So because I'm a just... crazy person. <laughs> yeah. Mad yeah, how, man. how dare you play a PC game with a keyboard and mouse? <laughs> Because I don't want to have to have auto aim, and I can actually, you know, headshot people. Then, yeah. but then you can't oh, well, yeah. I understand the appeal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Auto aim is the best. <laughs> um, the witness was a, a good example of there isn't an explicit tutorial, but um, when you start on the island, the the easiest to locate uh, puzzle screens um, unlock progressively. Mm. So you walk up to them to the first one, and it's a very straightforward basic puddle that teaches you the key mechanic for that series of puzzles and then you unlock the second which complicates it slightly further so it's just this 
natural um, progression as you move throughout the island and sometimes you'll wander in one direction to a point where you get across something difficult with a mechanic you haven't seen before, some new symbols or colours. So you wander around the island a bit more and you find the starter puzzle set mm. um, for that mechanic and work through it to, to pick it up and understand how you're supposed to to deal with it. Um, and it's it's all very natural and, yeah, interesting way of doing it. You're, you're right in that hmm. there's some areas yeah. of that island that are just ridiculously hard unless you've done that sort of, yeah. you know, that, that learner puzzle elsewhere. The, the, the fact that they're kind of separated makes it a little tricky, but... You, you kind of do find the, the starter puzzles in a lot more obvious locations. You don't have to sort of go digging yeah. for them. So, yeah, which is good. But I agree. I think that's a, that's a very subtle example of, of how you can do it um, very cleverly integrated with the rest of the game world. Um, yeah, for me personally, I would say Fallout 3 has one of my favorite tutorials because it goes, make a character. You're now born as that character. And then you have your very first sort of interactions with the world as a, like, a toddler and then as you're progressing through like it sort of helps determine what your character is going to be like and the choices you can make with your character as you grow up and it teaches you the combat mechanics and who doesn't love Liam Neeson narrating your mm -hmm. early childhood years like yeah. that's what you want I, so I did not I, know he narrated that that's cool <gasps> yeah he's, he's the dad, dad. Ah. also he's 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 said in stereo adorable you guys are the what cutest. Well, you guys said that in stereo. That was just so oh, cute. Fallout He's 4 your was dad. my first Fallout game, so, you know. Oh, yeah. well. Mm. Well, I actually, no, that, I, like, I, I lie. Sorry, I've Fallout got the control was. scheme of. <laughs> yeah, I've got the control scheme of Fallout 4, like, from the manual in the front of the... I bought a physical copy of it, and it's sitting on my desktop, <laughs> like, pinned to a board. So when I forgot what button was what on the controller, it tells me. <laughs> Wouldn't have happened in uh, Fallout 3. Nope, nope. <laughs> Fallout 4 was a different ball game. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I, I remember when I started playing the game, it was like next to me. And I was like, okay, that's a, all right, it's an X button. <laughs> Just like looking back and forward like I was studying the manual. Yeah, that was that was not a great example. Surely um, I have right, another Luke. great example. I know Luke wants to talk about one. I have a feeling this was put there by Luke, so go on. Really? No, I think I, I think you'll find your mistake. Oh, it was all this jam. is mine. My apologies. This is hundred percent mine, and it is the well, greatest then, tutorial known to mankind. It is. So For that's why I'm glad it's jam, not Luke. <laughs> <laughs> because it does everything wrong. Everything wrong. It's Far Cry Three, the Blood Dragon expansion. <laughs> Such it's a good game. Everything wrong. Okay, explain to me. I don't know anything okay. about this. Do you Go. know Far Cry Three or the Far Cry series? Basically, you're like I know a they young exist. adult. So Far Cry <laughs> Three is the adult. one with Vars, isn't it? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Yep, 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 yep. So you're on an island. You're stranded. There's nasty people everywhere, and you're just trying to survive and help your friends. The mm. Blood Dragon expansion is completely separate. <laughs> and completely so different. Everything you you've learned, forget. <laughs> oh, it's it's so utterly ridiculous and glorious. You start it and this bad 80s music starts with this really bad 80s animation. Cheesy as all hell. And it's introducing the new Cyber Commando of the future and your Sergeant Rex something or other. And, and you get, like, airlifted to this place. <laughs> and it's goofy as fuck. And you've got your offsider yelling at you. And the first thing that happens when you, like, sort of snap out of it or wake up is wakey wakey motherfucker you need to recalibrate and you're like what and you're looking around and then this female voice comes over your like dr darling is it dr darling oh i have forgotten her name yeah she starts talking in your ear because you know you're a cyber commando and everything's mm. just like not so like fluoro bizarro colors and she's like <laughs> uh learning tutorial program uh what, what does she say something like auto holstering weapons for silent approach and he goes oh fuck's sake <laughs> you fucking <laughs> asshole and so you can't get to your gun and then she starts going through all of these douchey little key commands like everything you hate about bad tutorials you get pop-ups that pause the game um, and he hates it as well press press x to <laughs> demonstrate your ability to read and he's like for fuck's sake and then oh, she'll so say, they have press... made tutorial the game damn it they've oh already my made god. it it's five <laughs> minutes of 
gloriousness. Every time yeah. she says something, he goes, I hate you. Just let me kill people. Why? <laughs> and he's so frustrated. His frustration mimics the frustration you feel when you're going through a bad tutorial. And then oh, brilliant. you're running around and you're learning how to move. And you're approaching an enemy and it's like a pop-up pops up. And she starts talking and she's like, distract unsuspecting enemies with your D20, nerd. And you can actually throw D20s to distract your opponents so that you can sneak up behind them to knife kill them. It's about knowing your audience, people. Oh, it's, it's about so really funny. Audience. And it's so wow. cheesy 80s dialogue, like vocabulary. And then right at the end of the tutorial, just before they get you get access to your gun, it goes through like 20 different pop-ups, half of them utterly garbagely useless. Things like, this tutorial was sponsored by X. And he's just like, no, God damn it! no, let me have my gun. I fucking hate tutorials. <laughs> this one is terrible. And it just takes forever and you're just mashing this case. It's like, come on. It's so funny. It treats you like an idiot mm. Um, mm. explicitly and it's so humorous. Uh, yeah, and the rest of the game, it's, it's just this little DLC that they created for it. Oh, it's you've got robot dinosaurs and all sorts of stuff. In, in the cheesiest, most oh, cliche. They're called badasses. I'm trying to remember what that stands for, though. Oh, I don't remember. They made the acronym say badass, and I Did can't they? remember what it stood for. I can't for. remember. It I sounds had to a look lot a video like that of this movie tutorial. that um, was kickstarted uh, last year. It's um, yes. so like What that. was it? Ninja Cop or something? Um, no. Oh, um, I don't know. I forget the name. I know the exact one you're talking about. The one about. that had uh, Hasselhoff doing the, the music for it. Um, God damn it. It's escaped me. Yeah, anyway, yeah. I'll open Netflix and have a look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But basically, <laughs> it's completely unrelated to Far Cry 3. It, no, it's just, just there was, amazing. There was no preparation, and it was so utterly incredible. People either love it or despise it. Kung Fury. Because, yes. Yep. Thank you. Oh, of course, yeah. So, See, yeah, it's just me, glorious. Any game which references Stan Bush's The Touch I can't hate. <laughs> I just can't do it. Can't I'm actually hate it. incredibly surprised that, Luke, you didn't mention Doom. Yeah, actually, that's probably a good call. I should have mentioned Doom because Doom has a amazing tutorial that uh, sets up the game world kind of perfectly too. Well, amazing in that just do the stuff. Here's a million things and explosions and rock music. And yep. <laughs> get used to it, motherfucker. <laughs> it, it, that is exactly what Welcome to Doom. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's good. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. You 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 um get stuck in straight away and don't have to muck around too much, which is exactly what the entire tone of the game is all about. You do. There's like alerts and yeah. exploding things, and here have this gun that kills everything ever. Ga- games that um, throw you in the deep end as far as the story driven stakes go, while still providing a tutorial at the same time, I think are really attractive. And a few games I can think of off the top of my head that do that. Um, I think what, one of my favorite games of all time, I've mentioned it already tonight, uh, Super Metroid is a great example of that because the, the opening tutorial menu of that basically throws you up against one of the end bosses of the game immediately. And he basically swoops yep. in and you crap yourself and you don't actually have to fight him proper. You, you sort of, you know, the, the fight ends abruptly and you have to do something else, but it's still really, you know, puts you on edge. Metal Gear Solid uh, 5, another great example, because the the opening tutorial of that game, basically you're trying to escape a hospital that is basically getting attacked by an unknown military force. Everything's on fire. You're crawling around trying not to get shot by these guys that are, you know, searching all of the rooms. And you're literally sort of crawling under curtain, under curtain, under curtain, and and trying to make your way out of this place with no weapons of your own. It's, It's very, very harrowing. Um, so that's a good example and um, Mass Effect 2 I think is a good example too like the, the very sort of intro to Mass Effect 2 really upsets the uh, the setting in terms of who you are and, and what you're doing um, and uh, it hit, hits the reset button in a lot of ways but it does it in a way that actually provides a really good context for a tutorial as well so without spoiling exactly what happens uh, Shepard sort of you know finds him ser- hel- himself or herself uh, at, very much out of water you know, in, a, in an environment where you have to kind of... Like a sticky situation. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the stakes are real high from the very first moment of that game. So, yeah, it's very, very cool how they do it. Um, and then I'll also add to that Uncharted 2. I'm also surprised you didn't mention that one being the Uncharted fanboy, where the tutorial is climb a train that's hanging off the side oh, of a cliff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I had forgotten. that was a good way. Yeah, it was just like... That's tense. That was a good, tense way to start. Very similar to Mass Effect 2. It just went... Boom, you're in it. Doom, oh God, boom, you're in it. Like, oh, God, I'm on a train over a cliff. So, no, that was, I quite enjoyed that one. Yeah. 
He's good. Apparently, the uh, the sense. Drake's uh, collection is on sale somewhere at the moment uh, on the PlayStation Store, I believe. Um, they're real, real cheap, so you can download all three of those uh, those original games at uh, super, super low price at the moment. So I might actually do that because I've I've still not played Uncharted Two. That's why I didn't mention it. <laughs> so I'm going to go back and do that at some point. Uh, much better than the tutorial for Uncharted Four. It sounds like where you're basically doing a uh, deep sea um, salvage operation, and it is boring as hell. You you literally. Yep. Wasn't great. No, it was not good. <laughs> it was not good at all. <laughs> no. Anyway, well, uh, to wrap things up, I think we're all pretty much on the same page then. We, we really like our tutorials that are kind of built into the game and, and don't feel like you're being led through a tutorial. They kind of uh, do their thing without being immediately obvious. I think that that tends to be the consensus that we like those a fair bit. So, yeah. Yeah. Which is good. Um, but yeah, I think there's some good and bad examples of tutorials and there will continue to be. So, um, I mean, I, I think about it a lot more than I, I used to, put it that way. It's something that I'll always notice on a game now rather than kind of just doing it and uh, fading into the background. Because if there's one thing that annoys the hell out of me, it's having to restart a game and go through a tutorial again that I didn't enjoy because you know that the opening mm. stages are going to be painful. So, mm. yeah. Um, all right, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. it uh, been a good chat tonight. Uh, Wait, one minute. Yeah, yeah. One minute, Luke. Dive in, dive in. One minute. Breaking news. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Jam has brought to my attention that there has been breaking news and I should have hashtag called it when we were doing the news piece because, Jam, yeah. did you want to fill in Luke and what happened oh, okay. while we were oh, recording? Well, there's an article on Eurogamer reporting they have sources that the mini SNES is already in production and will be out around Christmas. Ooh, Nothing man. official. <laughs> Nothing official, but very interesting. Interesting. So Sounds excited. Like it's that, that, if that actually <laughs> happens, that's a day one purchase for me. I'll fight every motherfucker out of that place to get all the <laughs> Well, see, okay, I said that about the mini oh. NES, so I'm reserving. I'm reserving. Um, but I will probably try and pre-order this one, to be honest. Yeah. I, I mm. missed out on the mini, so. Well, the- but it's super exciting. I'm very excited. Sn- and SNES I guess has- that solves the reason as to why they would discontinue the NES. It's because they're looking for st- to improve how they did the mini NES. Yeah, that's true. The SNES. Well, it's, the SNES, super exciting. SNES has some so, of yeah, my so- uh, top 10 favorite games of all time on it. So if they don't appear on the system, I'll be shocked. So that would be a great one. Oh, there's a good chance one of them at least won't be on their loins. So. Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, Good your loins. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. We'll find out. Anyway, all right, well, keep an eye out for that. Uh, keep an eye out for cool tutorials and games. Let us know if you have any that you uh, think are particularly good or bad, and uh, we'd love to hear about it. So you can mail us at the usual location, mail at partyloader.com. Uh, you can also leave uh, comments via our Facebook at uh, Party Loaded on Facebook. Uh, we're also on Twitter at Party Loaded Show. Uh, hit us up on Steam. Um, we have a Party Loaded group on Steam. Just do a search for it, and you'll find us pretty easily, so we can uh, sort of hang out and uh, play some games and chat about stuff there. Uh, we're also on iTunes, so if you're enjoying the show, please leave us a review there um, that would be greatly appreciated and uh, check out our content on the YouTubes you can find us at uh, youtube.com slash channel endgame um, and all of our episodes every single week go up on YouTube as well so if you prefer to uh, sort of listen to us uh, via that it's a audio only version but you can sort of minimize it in your browser and do other gaming and stuff so it may be more convenient for you you can check that out as well so yeah um, we've all got a little bit more uh, sort of time off before we have to dive straight back into to work responsibilities I'm assuming for, for most of us so what have you uh, all got planned for gaming in the next week anything exciting Odd. I, I'm i trying to diversify I want to get through Horizon <laughs> mm-hmm. the problem is I have Persona 5 songs running through my head 24-7 <sighs> oh gosh it's so good <laughs> it's so hard not to just play it <laughs> so yeah plans mm. plans might get short to shit mm. uh-huh. yeah how big a game is Persona 5? Could you just finish it? No. No, oh. hell no. <laughs> hell no. Oh, well. Between 60 well, to 100 to hours, to, isn't it? it you know. you yep. have to work through its uh, time increments that you That's have to yeah, complete. Yeah, yeah they say yeah. minimum minimum around like 60, 80 hours. Really? Mm. Damn. 100, they say 80 hours typical, 100 hours if you've not played that type of game before. Yeah. I think I'm approaching 50, but that's with a lot of pause time. Well, yeah, Jam, stop do causing something. your game. Oh, my God. Well, I have to. I'm like, I'm just going to go grab dinner real quick and suddenly it's half an hour. But, yeah. Well, I was going to say, Imogen, if you managed right, to make it, it through Persona 5 and you've already completed Horizon Zero Dawn this year, you are well on track to your New Year's resolution. <laughs> I know. Completing was it three AAA? No, just, it was just more. I just said more, right? Yeah. I mean, th- more AAA is completed. Three, three Horizon Zero Dawn, achievable. I'm done. Goal completed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Uh, well, I'm um, uh, looking forward to last diving year. back into uh, Final Fantasy um, 15 and uh, seeing if I can knock that one out because the, the big updates actually come through now where they fixed the Chapter 13. So that came uh, was it a number of weeks oh, ago. Because you didn't play it, yeah, you didn't play it until that fix came. I, well, I, I took a pause Some. for multiple reasons. That was one of them. Um, but I don't have any excuses now. I really should get back in and, and try and wrap that up. <sighs> I, I'm not going to pick up Persona just yet. I'm going to sort of maybe wait for that one to to come out on sale. I know I'll definitely play it this year. It's just a matter of when. So we'll check that out. And uh, Ollie, are you going to spend most of your next week or so uh, unknown battlegrounding or something? Different? Probably. Mm. That's a safe bet. Yeah. It's a very safe bet. <laughs> I need to check that out as well. Game is fun. Yeah. yeah. I want to get a podcast game going. I want us as a team. <laughs> All right. <sighs> Great. Imogen, if you do it, I'll I do it. I don't want to play it. I don't know. My, my computer won't play it. That's why. Oh, yeah. Oh, it like, really should. <laughs> oh, the minimum specs aren't that high. It sounds like it lag's a big issue, and I'm just really worried that I'm going to let the team down and I have a lot of anxiety about that. <laughs> eh, we all die. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. Well, I'll leave. Maybe, maybe. I'll- I've, I've got to, I've got to get some more time into Persona and finish my studies. So yeah. Mm. Yeah. we will see. Well, Ollie, uh, failing Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, uh, you may next few weeks, Dawn of War 3, baby. We've got to get on some of that action. Oh, yeah, that's a thing, isn't oh, yeah. it? Oh, yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah, I probably do that at some point. Yup. <laughs> Coming up real soon. Anyway, lots of stuff to keep our minds and attentions, uh, but until then, we should wrap it up for tonight. Send everyone to bed, and uh, thanks for listening, everybody. We will see you next week. Ta-ta! Bye, friends! The Party Loaded Podcast is a Channel Endgame production. For this and more great gaming content, bookmark channelendgame.com. <laughs>